What's good? What is up, ladies and gentlemen? This is your boy Bunny3000 back once again. Thank you guys so much for being here once again, spending the time that you guys probably ought to be playing Witcher 3, as you see over there in the corner, uh, with us instead. Because I know there's a lot of y'all crackheads out there that are just grinding away at Witcher 3, but take some time out, decompress, do a little meditation. Throw on some bunny and the Geek Swag crew and let us massage your mind with some geekology. Something. Anything. Anyways, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I don't think Makita's going to make it today. She's dealing with some allergies. So uh, she can barely talk. So she's going to try to be with us next week. Um, besides, she felt like uh, it was probably a good time for her to dip out this week anyway, since she knew that me and me and Jay were going to be doing some heavy, hardcore discussion about the game you see right there, Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. And I'm certain all of you guys who have tuned in that our gamers are very, very geeked up about this game. It's very big. It's been getting rave reviews. It's an action RPG. It's just everything that you would like from a blockbuster game. Apparently, both myself and Jason have um, acquired this game. So, uh, we have both begun just a little bit. Um, only a few hours in. Uh, but I will try to see if we can wait a bit to see if we can get Dirty Hell Mato in here. I think he's running a little bit late today. He said he was going to be here. Hopefully, I'll shoot him a message just to confirm, because otherwise, I'm going to veg out on this thing with y'all. Um, but, uh, before we even get to that, um, I guess what I can do in the meantime is kind of run down uh, some of the other stuff that I know other people are actually concerned about. Yes, some of you guys probably aren't really concerned about Witcher 3. Lo and behold, there are a decent amount of you guys out there that are actually interest, still interested in Destiny. It amazes me how uh, dedicated a lot of you guys are to this game. I honestly, I gave it 20 levels, a little bit of light uh, in order to uh, try to, you know, get my gear up to another level. And I, I just couldn't take the repetition. And honestly... The more I think back, you know, about my grind with Destiny, it's just like every other MMORPG. It's, you know, I was messing around with Neverwinter, and I know you guys saw me talking about that. That is the same thing. It's a grind. It grinds the same way. But because it's not a first-person shooter, it's a bit more acceptable in my eyes, which is odd, but it is. It's just me. Um, so, I don't know. It, it, apparently, uh, Destiny has been dropping bombs on the Destiny on the, the Destiny um, community here and there in the form of free updates. But today, uh, their non-free DLC update, House of Wolves, uh, was released. Um, and just to kind of give you guys a little bit of perspective on that, um, I'm looking at an article on Destructoid, which basically just kind of explains some of the stuff that's included um, in this DLC pack. Uh, let's see. It costs an extra 20 bucks if you... Uh, got like the regular version of Destiny and you know wanted to pick and choose your DLC um, apparently this add-on focuses in on uh, the story it doesn't contain a raid but it does have a, a story uh, elements to it um, apparently from what I'm told the story portion of the game only lasts about an hour or so until you're ready to take on uh, the new in-game uh, boss boss fight or whatever that's a part of the DLC. Um, there's a new strike called the Thief Shadow. Um, da -da 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 -da. They have some additional tweaks. 
Um, there is a Reef Social Hub, um, which is supposed to be like the tower, but it's much smaller. Apparently it looks better, but it's definitely most much smaller. Um, do, 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 do. There's a new damage limit. And there goes Dirty Helmato. Let's pull him into discussion. And say hello to the people. Helmato is in the place to be. He is in the house. <laughs> yes, I was basically getting things going a little bit. Uh, letting people know about, um, and of course they're looking at the gratuitous uh, uh not necessarily nakedness, but the gratuitous skin in uh, Witcher 3. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> got to start off for no <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all I got to say is uh, unicorns. <laughs> Pretty anyway, much. Um, but no, I was explaining to the good people here that uh, there are other things that have come out this week, aside from Witcher. I was going to wait till you got here to talk about it, but... Um, let me uh, get through the discussion I was actually starting uh, telling people a little bit about what the new Destiny DLC apparently provides them because there's uh, still a dedicated following of Destiny people out there yes you know, they are they Jay are and I are not person. there but there's still a lot of Destiny hoes out there I know man, you, with. I am shocked I mean there's there are people that just love well, the more and more I think about it, Jay, the more and more it kind of makes sense. I mean, and you know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about all you the help other. Out, man, because I can't, I can't grasp it. <laughs> well, no, fun. no. See, this is this is this is what I'm thinking. You remember how um, basically every MMO that we've ever played, or that maybe even you've ever played, most of them are essentially the exact same thing. You know, pretty they, much. you know, it's a pretty big, expansive world, but a majority of it is built around uh, you grinding, you know, either for that next level, for that particular uh, group of gear, or doing various things or challenges for your clan, right? So, pretty regardless much. of what other core gameplay each one of the MMOs provide, that's always what you're going to do. You're always going to have a decent amount of repetition in each one of those games. Now, some, it's a little bit less pronounced than others. And unfortunately, which was our burn, Dust Destiny is kind of on the upper end in terms of the repetition because it's not quite as big of a world as some of the others. Uh, it's, it's a lot smaller. Right. But in the same vein, you know, like, as I was playing, you know, because I was kind of quickly comparing it to like Neverwinter, you know, I mean, close. and for the most part, as I was playing and thinking about me spending the gratuitous amounts of time messing around with Neverwinter, you know, it, the same things that I was like crucifying Destiny for, not necessarily all of the same things, but some of the same things I was crucifying Destiny for are actually things that I came to expect to have to do in Neverwinter and I think that was only because of the different kind of perspective you know it was like a third person action game so I didn't mind that my uh, all of my uh, villains or people that I'm going around to defeat all pop up for the most part in the same place you know what I mean okay. and um you know, then on some of the like daily dungeons and daily challenges, which are similar to all the little goofy little strikes and stuff, um, you're pretty much doing the same uh, like mission over and over again. And really, the only thing you're really hoping for is bigger, better loot each time you do it. You know, which Destiny does in the same vein. And then as I started thinking about it, the thing that separates. Uh, games like or MMOs like Neverwinter from Destiny is that well after you're done with that for the most part that's really all you have with Destiny aside from like the raids 
and the all the raids are are like trying. You remember how when we used to play with uh with Doom on Borderlands when we had that one DLC that had that massive vault. Yeah, 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 the real big one. Yeah, and then, like, after you finished it, then we went all the way up that big elevator to fight that huge crab. Yep. So, you know, in my mind, that's what a raid is in Destiny without the vault. You know, all it is is just a massive, huge boss battle um, that you essentially have to take forever to get to and defeat. You know? And and oh that is like the I, I don't want to say that's the end game for Destiny, but it almost is because the multiplayer is kind of tacked on there. It doesn't really have a purpose in my mind. Yeah, it's aside just, from it's, like it's, challenges. Yeah, it's but just the like, difference it's just is, it's like match. yeah, and I mean, which they also have in Neverwinter. They do the exact same thing. Um, but the other level that I recognize that other games, like whether it's World of Warcraft or Neverwinter, or even, um, well, I haven't really played Dust enough to really understand it that much. But even beyond all of that stuff, games like Neverwinter and everything, they have these really in-depth, whether they're story elements or really in-depth, uh, higher-level uh, campaigns that you can't even participate in until you get to high levels. That kind of opens up a whole new aspect of the game. You know, once you get your gear right, once you do enough of the multiplayer things to get said gear and join clans and get your mounts and all other kind of stuff. You're talking about all these different things in Neverwinter. And then you look at Destiny, it's like, okay, well, where is all that stuff? Because after you, like, just like you said, once you get up to between, like, level 20 and level maybe not even 30, but maybe 25, you've seen and done just about everything in that game ad nauseum. Pretty much. You know? Yeah. And and it seems like these DLC that they're adding, from what I'm reading in this Destructoid article, it doesn't add... um, essentially any size to the game at all nope it added a little from what it said here the guy one of the guys that's reviewing it it added maybe like an hour more to the storyline it added another big boss battle and then it added a number of like additions um like another you know social hub and some other stuff so it was like okay you're paying twenty dollars for what and i think People that understand what MMOs are and things like that, that's I think that's where they they uh, they fall apart because you know what? Destiny is not a bad game. It's, no, it, by not any means. By not any means. I, it's I just think not a traditional enough, MMO in my mind. Yeah, it's not a traditional MMO and you're missing so much content, man. It's just like, dude, where where is all the content? That, you know, shit, even if they had fetch quests, it would have been fun. Yeah. Oh, you're right. But they don't have anything. And that's that's no. what it is. And I know they're going for a hybrid thing with the first person shooter. And I, I, I get it. You know, but it's just the game can't be that small. You can't have a MMO campaign be five hours and then have multiplayer. So basically, like, I don't I don't consider that game an MMO at all. At all. At all. It, it, it has no... It has... RPG elements, and when I when I take that, that very that, loosely, very lightly, very like loose, that, very loose on that that aspect of it. Um, and like I said, there's no content. There's no way on an MMO or MMO hybrid or whatever you want to call it, you're gonna, you know, be done with it in five hours. So I think that's where it loses a lot of people that understood what that Destiny world could have been. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think and that's yet the, there's still something there. Because no, you know what? Still yeah, that, I, I know exactly there, what it is. There's still that core group of people that I guess are just so rabid fans of like Halo oh, and that and, and Call of Duty. Yeah, that's, and Call of that's Duty. That's basically that it what just it is. Dude, it's, all, all it is, it's another Call of Duty game that's that's uh, that was in the middle. 
you know, that was giving people something to play besides Call of Duty. Because yeah. once you're done with the campaign, that's what you have. You have Call of Duty. Yeah, pretty much. You basically, yeah, yeah. I guess that's what it is. People that are into what is it called? The uh, gaunt, not the gauntlet. Any 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 MMO RPG person, I guarantee you, is not playing that. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, because they 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 thought they knew what it was. They you know we all like that. Ooh, we're getting a combo of first person and this yo this is gonna be off the chain i mean me personally i was hyped yo oh yeah well, you saw me yeah i, I mean all into it about the collector's edition oh not. yeah but besides besides uh besides multiplayer and the rage which is like a horde mode yep that uh, you ain't got nothing yeah it's Man. it's so light and it's still light it's still despite light. all the content that they keep adding and uh you know, explaining, you know, Dude, that they, all hey, all we're that, adding and doing all no, this. No, they're stuff doing there. exactly what I thought after a while what they were going to do. They're doing basically the Call of Duty. When Call of Duty adds uh, um, expansions, it's basically a map pack. And that's all they're doing is they're adding a map pack to mm-hmm. your game. Yep. So that's, I mean, and I'm not hating on them. I just, I'm just, the only it's thing just I'm not a, our thing. That's all. I mean, yeah, that's really all it I is. Basically, I thought it was going to be a different game. That's right. basically what I thought. It's, it's just not our thing. Because even with that... I don't want that. I'll play Call of Duty. Or right. I'll play Halo. I mean, because the weird thing... And like we were saying before, the weird thing is that even with that realization, you know, there's still some people that are able to overlook it and say, yeah, I was expecting more also, but I like what's there. You know, and like you said, that a right. lot of that is for people that are just hardcore first-person shooter lovers you know oh yeah i mean are part, into it big yeah time. big time i mean i i i could definitely see the appeal i mean like if you if you're a call of duty fan you're gonna you're just gonna be like wow this is awesome and yeah. it is awesome because it gives you a little bit taste of I'm not even sure what you would call <laughs> the little bit of taste is you know when you go to the citadel and get the rank up your armor Gives well, you a little it, bit more yeah, than Call of Duty would give you, you know, but... It, it kind of gives you... It kind of... You know what it kind of does? It It's one of the first first-person shooters that is that wide-ranging of a co-op game that allows you to do kind of like loot-based grinding and, and leveling as you do in Borderlands... And it allows you to tinker around with getting, you know, armor pieces and armor and clans and stuff as you would in a Diablo. Yep. And then it allows you to take all of that stuff and allow you to brag over it as you use it in, like, a Call of Duty kind of arena. Yep. And for some people, that's all it takes. You know, they could care less about the story. They're like, yo, I can deck out my dude in, like, this ill armor and you know that's like themed to whatever clan or whatever that they're looking or faction or whatever in the game and then they can come out with you know these crazy looking pistols rocket launchers and stuff like that and just wail upon people left and right in yep. the in the iron throne tournament and all these other little tournaments to keep popping up and stuff and that's and what I will give Bungie is that they are probably between them and Rockstar. I think they do, um, well, not even just Rockstar. Maybe even Bioware also. Those developers, when it comes to interacting with their community online in terms of the multiplayer community, they do it extremely well. They have a lot of little events. They add a lot of little challenges in there. You know, they throw all these little goodies and stuff here and there through Twitter and everything. They do a lot of, like, extracurricular um, interaction with their community. Um, and somebody is calling me on the phone. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what, yeah, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, why you turn off the music, man? <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> um, goodness, sorry about that, little Jim. I had to put the thing on. Frizz not break. 
Um, but yeah, like I was saying before, they uh, you know they they have their own little formula. Hey, what's going on, Dark Assassin? Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Um, but uh, I, I, before we jump in, <laughs> yeah, darkness is. Um, before we jump into you know the little Witcher three talk, I did want to kind of see what else to make people aware of that is out today aside from Witcher three. Um, you know what? Not much. I didn't, uh, I didn't think there was much. Dropping. Yeah, something called um, Life is Strange episode three. Not sure what that is. No, I, that's probably an independent. I'm guessing that's an independent game. I don't know. Um, and for those who love all these crazy simulators that come out, Farming Simulator 15. Ooh, <laughs> I'm up on that, yo. I think. Well, I'm actually, you know what? Way. Makita <laughs> actually said that she was interested. Remember, we were talking about that. Is that what the one she was interested? That was the one she was talking about because she said that she like worked on a farm at one point and she was kind of interested in one of the older. Uh, farming simulators how detailed like some of the farming equipment was you know that she actually recognized you know and in some of the different ways you have to operate it and use it and stuff they kind of had down pat in this particular simulator so yeah it's it's kind of it amazes me the games that get made sometimes and the size of the community that actually oh like uh goat simulator yeah, Goat Simulator. And Yo, people love that thing, man. I was like, what? Really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, whatever does it for you, man. You know what I mean? If you want to be a goat, or, you know, there was another one that came out called I Am Bread. Where you are, <laughs> where your you like mission through bread? that whole game is to become toast. Nice. So, I, I, I can't call it anymore. Once I saw that that was a game and that a decent number of people were buying it. I was like, I'm done. I'm not making fun of anybody for making any kind of game anymore. If people are buying uh, Goat Simulator, then I I can't say anything. Just can't. That's right. Pretty much after that, you're toast. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. So, uh, um, let me do this before we before we jump into uh, Witcher Three. Have before we started playing Witcher Three, was there been anything in particular that you that you played or attempted to play in the past week or so? No, I, I've been getting my ass whooped at work, so that that's been my, <laughs> my, my big thing. Um, Actually, you know what I did start playing, and I don't know if I mentioned this before. What's that? Um, the the Telltale Games version of a uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, how is that? Dude, I you know how you know how Game of Thrones it's just got such an intricate kind of plot line anyways, and it seems like the Telltale Games direction was the perfect way to go. Dude, it is. I mean, the way this game is set up, it pulls you it pulls you into this story so much that it's really really interesting because you know it's it's all conversation based for the most part, right? Right. Which goes hand in hand with Game of Thrones, with all the political, you know, jockeying and everything that goes on in King's Landing and everything. So without giving away too much, the the setup for this game is uh, you remember the red the red wedding? Yes. So it basically takes place right when the red wedding happens. Okay, And you are. As a player, you're basically taking the taking on the role of a house that's called House Forrester, that is one of the bannermen for House of Stark. Okay. So you know, at the red wedding, uh, I forget which Stark boy dies or whatever. I forget what his name is, but you know, at the red wedding, yes, yes, he dies, right? So. You, you know, the very first person you play as is one of the squires of one of the uh, uh, elders of House Forrester, you know, and he's there to support the Starks, you know, at the wedding and everything. And, of course, they know that after they leave there, they're supposed to be going to war. Right. So, you know, all of a sudden the squire starts seeing something going down, of course, and then all of a sudden everything goes to crap. 
And the elder of House Forrester essentially dies in that battle. And he gives, you know, the house sword to the squire to take back home. Okay. So, um, you know, once you get back home, the only ones left um, in the family are the younger, are two younger brothers. Um, you know, it, it's it almost ends up sounding as if you know this house is very similar to the house to the to the Stark family, right? Because it because like the the eldest son that's home at the time is maybe only twelve years old. Yep. And then there's another one that's maybe like nine years old, and then there's a twin sister, you know, and. The elder, elder or the oldest sister is actually a handmaiden for the girl that's going to be the queen that's going to marry Joffrey. What's her name? Uh, queen um, uh, Martell um, or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, Martell. Um, I forgot her first name there. Right. So, you know, your the character you end up playing as in King's Landing is, you know, her handmaiden, and they are like really, really good friends. So it's like you end up getting thrown into this massive plot where you have to interact with Queen Cersei um, and not completely embarrass um, the soon-to-be queen. Um, and they, they really, they've only done one episode so far. Um, and then the other person you have to become is uh, the young lord who ends up having to take over the house, you know, House Forester. And you know that guy... Um, in Game of Thrones now, that is the warden of uh, Winterfell. Yes. Yeah, he's you know he's like a snake, and he made a. Uh, um, oh gosh, what is that guy's name? Uh, he made that other guy that his dog or whatever. I forget what he calls him. Uh, Reek. <laughs> Reek. Yes, he calls him Reek. Right. So that guy, you end up having to interact with that guy as well. Um, because you, of course, are one of the bannermen for the Starks or for whoever is Lord of Winterfell. So because this guy ends up becoming Lord of Winterfell, you have to interact with this guy. And he is he's like ruthless. You know? Yes, he is. And uh, so it's it's always nerve wracking because you're trying to not piss him off. But you're trying to impress him, but you're trying to make certain that you don't dishonor your family all at the same time, and you don't want to go to war because you can't really afford to because you don't have the manpower. You know, so it's like all these things are running through your mind, and you're trying to figure out what is the right decision to make, and there's no real clear path, which is, you know, which is basically the way the the show is in Game of Thrones. You know, right. they weave it perfectly in this thing, and. I got hooked. I was playing it at lunch. You oh, know? Wow. And I breezed through this first episode and dude, it it you know, just like when I was playing uh Walking Dead the Telltale the Telltale games, it, I mean it's it's amazing how well written their stories are because every time you do something, you question yourself because after you do it it says, "Oh, so and so Remem- will remember that you said that and you're like oh what did I say again <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean after you make certain conversation choices and you see their reactions or you see you know because the animation is just good enough that their faces are very very expressive so at any one moment you could think that they're frowning but they might ease their face up just enough where you think that, okay, they might only be slightly disappointed or whatever. You know, it's hard to really 100% place where their reaction is every time you do a conversation unless they're speaking to you. Yeah. So um, I have, to, I definitely have to give big ups to Telltale because, you know, it's it, just playing that one episode, I was hooked again. I was like, oh, man, now I got to go back and try to see if I can – breeze through the rest of uh, Walking Dead since I know all those episodes are there and I gotta wait for uh, you know this next episode in Game of Thrones to get released so I was like yo this you know it's it, it captures you really quick it really really does and they're cheap 
Yeah, you know like, I mean? what, what are they, like a few bucks? Or no, uh, well, a whole season, a whole season is like fourteen dollars uh, or something. Yeah, it's like, like that. fourteen bucks. You know, and it's and it's definitely worth it. It's de- and every once in a while they end up having sales, anyways. But oh man, I was hooked. It's a very, very, very good game. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, Game of Thrones. You gotta check it out. Walking Dead. You gotta check it out. You know, Bikita's well, been raving and reviewing about uh, what is it, Wolf Among Us. I might have to check that out after I finish Game of Thrones. Right, I mean, Bunny Among uh, Us. not Game of Thrones, uh, Walking Dead. And then they've got the other one. They did one in uh, Borderlands that they just started. Oh, Tales, right. Tales of Borderlands, or whatever. And Tales they're going to the be doing. Uh, no, they're going to be doing Marvel next. Oh really? Yeah, they got they got a license to start doing Marvel storylines. So Lord knows what they're going to be doing with that. You know, they haven't even announced anything about that yet. Oh yeah. So yeah, Telltale is 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 doing it big, doing it big. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see over here on the on the left left hand side, I'm over here adventuring, getting slaughtered. All that <laughs> kind of stuff, running around, picking, picking, picking flowers, picking, picking flowers. mushrooms. That's what I was doing. I was picking mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, product. as you guys can see, what I'm discussing, what we're discussing here, Witcher Three Wild Hunt, and uh, we we have a slight treat for you guys. We have two completely different perspectives on the game. Unfortunately, we don't have a third. Makita doesn't have the game. Um, uh, she doesn't have a next gen console yet, but I. Th- but she's getting there. She's getting there. She's getting there. I think she has a new gaming PC though, so it would be interesting to see if we could see if uh, you know a cheaper um, PC version would work on her rig to see how her rig is and everything. But um, I will. Uh, default a little while for Thicken Nation since you are the Witcher expert between the two of us um uh you know kind of break down what you've seen in the very short amount of time you've you've played it or dug into it in terms of what you see is different from witcher 2 or even witcher 1 if you've played witcher 1 i haven't played witcher 1 but I, i i have a pretty good on well pretty okay understanding of the whole storyline Mm-hmm. So basically, like um, in The Witcher One, from what I read, there was um, you know you got Geralt. He wakes up um, in this last Witcher stronghold, mm-hmm. and uh, he's pretty much fighting this fra- faction to um, that wants to take the Witcher's blood or like DNA or whatever to create these super human race uh, of uh, soldiers to defeat like this force that's um, these forces that are coming into I guess you would call it Earth Realm. So basically they're like, you know, people don't understand why witches are their monsters and stuff like that. So they're like these gods they let these pretty much, you know, beings interact with this Earth Realm. So that's yep. You know that's kind of like a quick summary of the first one. So he does he while while this is happening, he he loses his memory, you know. Mm-hmm. And then um, in in the second one, which I play, uh, which I played the, um, you know, he still he doesn't still have a good um, memory of what he who he is. So the the actually is he just the, who he is or what he is. He knows what he is, but he doesn't remember a lot of his past. Okay. So, in the second one, um, Assassin of Kings is, you know, he uh, he helps, you know, defeat this army. The king's pretty happy about it. And there's an assassination attempt on his life. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Gerald comes in, do his spot, you know, <laughs> saves the day, right? And, you know, he starts doing some investigating in, and he finds out that it's a witcher that's trying to kill the king. Okay. So he ultimately gets framed for what's happening, and because he, is he a witcher at that point, or is he just an assassin? He he's a witcher at that point. So you know he 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 kind of gets gets caught up in, in the politics of it, and they throw his ass in jail. Okay. Right. 
So he gets pent up in there, and then he has like a quest with this dwarf. He has uh, companions, this dwarf. I forgot his name. And then there's Triss, which is uh, she's a uh, mage. Uh, she's a redhead. You'll probably get you'll probably get to see her in this thing. And he had like this like DL relationship going on with her. You know, it's kind of <laughs> weird. It's like, did he hit it? <laughs> you know, kind of deal, right? So, um, he has his uh. Uh, wife or girlfriend, if you may, that he's looking for, uh, Jennifer, and you know he's trying to find her out through, you know, not focused on her, but find out what's going where where she disappeared to, mm-hmm. and apparently because he had some involvements with the Wild Hunt, which are are extraterrestrial beings not from this world, but you know they they don't know. They're like they're not like outer space, but they're like I don't know. I guess <laughs> I was about to called, say it's like uh oh Indiana Jones. You know they're like demons or whatever. They don't belong in this world, but right. you know they do that. So they they scooped up Jennifer. So that's you know he spends quite a time splitting his time between finding out who this assassin is and what's going on with them, and then in Witcher Two you kind of find out it's a double cross. You know it's a trap. Yeah, basically, it's a whole trap, right? So he gets all messed up on what's going on there. I don't want to go into too much detail if anybody's ever or playing it because it's free on Xbox 360. Um, so he gets caught up with all of that. Now, in this third one, they introduce Siri, which is, I thought was his daughter, but it's not. It's um, Oh, the little girl at the beginning? Yeah, she's like a, she's like a daughter to him, but she's not his daughter. Right. Well, I did some reading today, and I found out that the witchers, uh, based on like the potions and the stuff and the the religion they follow, mm-hmm. they are sterile, so they can't have kids. <laughs> right, so they can't have kids. So he took her as a protege, and you know that was his thing. That was so, his adopted daughter, right, essentially. Right, right. So which is why he caught the feels for her when she died in his little vision. In his little vision, exactly. So, and I'm not spoiling anything here, people. This is no, at the that's, beginning of the game. So, yeah, that, there's not much to spoil there. So, um, he is basically, you can tell he's he's, you know, he's inquiring about Jennifer, uh, trying to figure out what's going on there with her, and uh, you know, at some point, Siri's probably going to pop up in the store, and she's, I, I believe, she has a big role to play. So, mm-hmm. um. I'm 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 just excited to get into this game, man. It's just, you know, fantastic. I mean, I know some of the stories. So, like, I, I I know who the Wild Hunt is. They're not, you know, they were brought up in The Witcher Two. So, but very, you know, you didn't actually see them. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the group. But uh, they 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 were mentioned um, in Witcher Two. So, you know, it, it you don't really, from what I can tell. You'll probably get a lot of that backstory as as soon as you probably get deeper into the game. Mm-hmm. Um, they may give you some of that. I'm just I'm taking a guess. I don't know because I'm only a few hours in, but um, I'm assuming that they would do something like that for first time players because this game is, uh, from what I can tell, it's huge, man. It's it's just gonna be a big game. It's gonna be massive. You know, people. It, it's just gonna be nuts. I mean, from the little bit I played of it, I, I really enjoy it. Um, some huge RPG elements. I mean, it's just deep. It, it, it's deep, man. <laughs> it's deep. So, I mean, the second one was pretty, pretty big. Um, as far as RPG stuff, but I mean, you had to do a lot of stuff. So this is this is the million dollar question, Thick Nation. Um, what? Is- and what I want you to do is compare your uh geek out level at this stage of playing the game to when you to a similar amount of playing time when you first got Dragon Age Inquisition Ooh. which one is higher uh my geek out I, I dude I've been waiting for what you man when they announced it man I was so I, I was so upset when they pushed it back a couple of times <laughs> mm-hmm. you just would not believe how like unhappy I was so um I gotta say, my geek out definitely got to go on Witcher Three. Um, I love the storyline. I love the 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 stuff you can do. I know it's not as you know like the other RPGs. You can be you know you pick a class. You're just this one guy. There's not much class picking. Um, you're just him. Um, but it's it's just 
dude, Geralt's badass, yo. I just love that character. <laughs> so, like, I mean, I, I really don't care to be another character. I don't really care to be, um, you know, s- somebody else. It's, you know, he's, to me, he's that, he's that good. So, nice. my, on my geek scale, I, I gotta say, Witcher 3 is definitely, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm not a summer gamer, but uh, I will be because of this game. Nice, nice. So I'm That's definitely, impressive. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'll be on it probably later on. I won't probably get a lot of time to play it tonight, but uh, uh, I'll probably get a good, solid, maybe, which is nothing in RPG world. It's like an hour. Oh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah you know, I'll be, I might be able to change a few inventory items, and that's it. <laughs> Make a potion. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, that's it, I'm done. Um, And for myself... um. You know, honestly, I when I first heard how much you and Makita were into it, of course, it it piqued my interest because I mean, you know, it it's rare that both of y'all are this geeked up about any game, you know, that you guys have to play. So of course, I was like, look, I gotta, I gotta take a, you know, I gotta take a, uh, take a chance <laughs> on this, take a stab at this thing, see what see what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because you know. I had, I had read and heard about um, you know Witcher Two and that it was great that it played well you know it was a little bit wonky some of the game mechanics kind of annoyed some people but it was still you know it was still story wise something that pulled you along and I just kind of avoided it you know just mainly because there were so many other things i was playing and it ended up being you know just like all those other games you were telling me about like that i bought that have like found an interesting little place on my shelf like dishonored and uh dishonored was pretty good you yeah, know but it's, um, it's just you got to be into it exactly and i and i don't doubt it after listening to you guys and it, it, it's ended up being one of those where you know, if I get a good vacation or something like that, and I'm tired of playing Battlefield 4 for the 10 millionth time, you know, and I just want to start something fresh, something new, that it'll be one, you know, it'll be one of those kind of afternoon games that I'll jump in, pop in, just to see what the story's like and see how, how much it pulls me in. But, um, you know, I was like, you know what, I, I gotta do this Witcher thing, um, it, it sounds like it's really good. It sounds like it's right up my alley. And honestly, when I first when I first popped it on, and I first started trying to do like the tutorial, you know, and everything you see there um, that that I'm doing there, messing around with inventories and you know all all that other kind of stuff. Learn trying to figure out what you see there is is going through the little cards that the shopkeeper has. Right, that's, selling that's, cards and stuff and like that. And what's cool about that is, just on a little side note, in Witcher 2, they had so many side games that you could play. Mm-hmm. So, like, you could spend hours, like, I don't know if they'll introduce in this one, I haven't gotten far enough, but, like, there's two, you had a brawling thing that you could go to. So, you could go into, like, these these taverns mm-hmm. and just start picking fights with dudes. <laughs> right? <laughs> And you you can brawl out for cash, yo. You bet how much money you think you can whip this dude's ass, mm. and yo, you got paid. I made a lot of money that way. <laughs> Which actually, and you know, and and that doesn't really surprise me because um, that's actually pretty common for a lot of action games nowadays to have little mini games like that. Because yeah. you know, like GTA Five, they have a bunch of that. Um, Assassin's Creed had, you know. Dice games and card right. games, card and games, and fighting stuff like games, that. and that little kind of stuff all thrown in there as well. Um, whaling, you know, it, there's a lot more, a lot more now. A lot more of these games are starting to fill up a lot of the downtime or whatever in their game with yep. bunches of little mini games and stuff in there. And just like you said, this time around, it actually feels like it is an actual part of not necessarily even the storyline but it fits with everything that you're doing in the game it doesn't feel tacked on it really does feel like something that hey you know what you know i've just finished defeating this griffin or this you know 
uh, whatever other little beast is. You know what? I just found this card sitting over there. Let me see how many people I can beat. You know, when I go to the nearest tavern or something like that. Because, you know, every once in a while you can do it and win some money. Yep. And so, and you, you know, it. it's a and little distraction. It's a little distraction when you when you get caught up with too many quests and stuff like that. It's It's definitely a good, you know quick thing you could do and you mm-hmm. know people probably don't realize yet but there's gonna be some porno in there so but you know, yeah that, that, that'd be a quick a superbly mature game right um, it's definitely not for the kiddies no it's um, by no means a kitty game but th- those those are things that you know i liked about the game uh initially so that you know now, you could, okay f psalm i gotta call bs on you on this one which one is that? Um, what you just said is one of the biggest reasons why you were all into this game. Both me and you know the primary reason why <laughs> this game hooked you for as long as you did was the brothels. Don't lie. Don't I, be telling people no fizz. Tell them that you love the brothels. Tell it. I did, yo. I did. I, I spent mad dough in those things. Uh-huh. <laughs> It was like real life porn of a son. <laughs> I was in there. I was trying to get loose. I was trying to get like mad. <laughs> Rabbit dubs. If that's what you want to call it. <laughs> mm-hmm. no, that's why I'm going to leave it because, you know, I'm not trying to have a too graphical, graphicalized uh. <laughs> up in this piece. You know, I'm certain they'll I'm certain a lot of the people that uh, will be playing this game will understand when they get to the, the unicorn phase. Yeah, there, I mean, there's tons one. of it. I mean, there's tons of stuff in there. So, like, it, it's it's definitely not uh, PG thirteen. It's it's more on the R rated tip there. Yes, I believe sir. the last. I believe the last one was rated <laughs> really mature. So, I, I mean, it, you know, it, it's definitely an adult game. You have a lot of adult decisions to make. Um, just for some of the reviews that I read, they're like, you know, you know, a lot of games claim that the decisions you make. Um, you know, affect the outcome of the game, yep. and and a lot of times you play them, you really don't feel like you're affecting it, anything. Yeah, you know, it's you know, it's it's scripted. Um, right. A guy, excuse me, a guy was talking about how he had to kill some wraith at one point, or or not kill, but decide if a wraith was going to live or die. Right. Yep. And I get you know whatever he didn't really tell you what he chose, but he said that decision affected the storyline down the road because that same decision he made based off of that mm-hmm. somebody died because he made a bad decision <laughs> 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 right so so like you know it sounds like you're going to get that uh, in this i mean um you know i've heard some other people say that the plot the main story plot was lackluster so far i mean i, I I'm, I'm right on point with the main uh story plot so i can't i don't have too much of an opinion on it because i haven't gone through uh all of it right um but uh it so far it looks good i mean like i mean i mean you only a few hours into it so i'm only a few hours in but like i mean i usually don't really enjoy a game till i start getting to the meat and potatoes of the game you know especially like an rpg because you know how rpgs are you take you could be 10 hours in and you you're not even having a lot of fun you're grinding Right, because you know? you know if you try to go anywhere serious with the, you know, with that anything character, of consequence, you get blown you're gonna get water. Yeah, pretty much, right? But I mean, just I, I probably only got about three hours in on it, but like those three hours, I actually had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun, actually, and you know why you would have a lot of fun because you were doing little fetch quests, and little side quests, and stuff, trying to <laughs> trying to build your dude. <laughs> that, well, that's what it is. You, you picking any, flowers. Any, any RPG game, you trying to get you trying to get XP, so you're doing whatever you can to get that because you ask that that XP, man. It's that's what you live for. You live for that XP, so you got to go around. You got to pick flowers. You got to pick up all the side quests. Hey, I, I lost my frying pan. All right, I'm going to find it for you. <laughs> it's stupid, but you're going to get that girl a frying pan because you know what? She's going to give you $70. <laughs> yep. So, you know, you're going to do it and you're going to get, you know, you're going to get some XP. You're going to be able to boost something um, to help you, you know, get past that that first initial hump. Right. You know? So, so that you um, don't feel so powerless at the beginning of the game. Exactly. But the, the thing is with... Uh, 
if Witcher three stays true to two, you're 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 gonna beast out, but you're never gonna beast out to a point where it's not a challenge right. because what Witcher does it's gonna is keep you on your toes throughout the game. keep you on your toes. It's not like when you get to a a certain point you're gonna be able to just uh, roll Breeze. through everybody. Yeah. You're you're gonna still have to find out what their weaknesses are, do an investigation, do the whole nine, and that that's one thing I liked about two, which is the same as three. You got this detective mode that you can go in and you, you can you know you have to really, Batman. Yeah, pretty much. You got to figure out the clues and and all that stuff, which is is I they expanded on it on three, which is I, I love it. Mm. So you know they. I, I can't give up m more props to to CD Projekt Red. I mean, they're 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 doing their thing. I mean, they're 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 wrecking shop with uh with which I, I I'm just I'm I'm so impressed with the uh, final product. I'm not disappointed at all from the few hours I played. I mean, it's I I, I just expect so much more out of this. I mean, I, I'm I'm open, man. I'm just, <laughs> I, I, Right now, I'm like, you know what? It's 10 o'clock. We need to kill this show. I need to go clap. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. And, oh, you, know, you know what? I, I haven't been, I, I got to honestly, I haven't been this excited about a game in a long time. And I'm, I'm happy to be excited about a, uh, a good RPG game um, right. coming out. Because, I mean, I don't think I'm going to have this much since I've, I've had fun playing Skyrim. Yeah. 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 It's pretty deep. It's pretty deep. I'm happy for you, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm really happy for you. Well, Glad I hope, I hope, your, uh, your game I hope match. You, I hope you you get some good clacking fun out of this too, man. I mean, shit. I mean, Ed, like I was saying before, I'm to the point that I've played so far. I I'm enjoying recognizing that despite the game giving you a tutorial on how to do stuff, there's actual depth in the combat because in my mind, when it comes to games of this sort if they don't provide multiple ways for you to take on your foes and multiple ways for you to look like the ultimate badass whenever you're whenever you're playing the game um then you're going to get real bored with using the same combo or the same method exactly. or the same weapon to take out every single enemy that you have to grind through in the game oh yeah i can use a bow or i can use this hammer and I've had this bow and hammer for the last 20 levels. You know, I mean, they work, but I just haven't found anything else better because these things are pretty badass. And the next thing you know, you're like, okay, you know what? I'm tired of using this one hammer finishing move <laughs> on all these little rabbits because <laughs> I keep finding that, that's, rabbits. That's, that's kind of where Dragon Age kind of left you. I, I just thought they didn't have enough. Like, the game is yeah. good, but they didn't have enough uh, uh, gear. You know, I just, it, I was just like, where yeah, they're, they're, I don't want to say their loot system was broken, but in a sense, it kind of was. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it wasn't, it really didn't, their crafting system was really good, but it did. Yes, I thought it was excellent. It wasn't balanced with their actual loot system. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I can't describe it. It was to a point where you didn't care what you found, you didn't care what you buy. You, you just cared about all the ingredients and whether and you ingredients. had the exactly. stuff to make stuff to make what you right what you want. You know what I realized like through a lot of the game, I ended up. You, you know, like when you you first get into an RPG, right, and then mm. you find all this stuff and you keep it at the beginning because you don't know the significance of it until you start getting into the game. Yep. Right. You may find some weird thing. You be like, "Ooh, what's that?" Right, and you hold on to it. I found in Dragon Age that I kept a lot of those things and I didn't even use them. Yep. And I could have actually sold them off and done other things, you know, to better my character because these these items that I thought that were so rare and they and, really and weren't. <laughs> they really weren't. And there was not much you could actually do with them. And right. I, and there was no way to really know that you really didn't need to keep them because it was that's just right. the, it didn't, the game it didn't, was. They scared right. you into want to keeping everything. Everything, right. So, like, I mean, at least with The Witcher, they, they class things for you that mm. you get. I mean, like, when you have something that's junk, it tells you, this is junk. Yep. It can be sold to do this. So you you don't, ooh, my lights are flickering over here. Ooh, the thunder and lightning, buddy. 
<laughs> so like you know you you were never afraid. Oh, the light went out. I think he's in the dark. I think he's in the dark. So I think he's in the dark. What, what, what? You See, know, like you might get your wish in the wrong way. <laughs> I hope not. If the witcher pop up behind me, that's it. I'm done. Here. So <laughs> like, uh, you know, like that 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 I don't like with RPGs. Which not all of them do that, but some of them they they give you so much stuff in the game. Mm-hmm. And the stuff that they give you is of no consequence. Right. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything to anything. It doesn't doesn't hold any weight. And I, I find that useless because why would you program something into the game and waste all that time to put it in there? And you're not going to do anything with it. You can't sell it. You can't do anything. It's just there. Yeah. And, you know, Dragon Age did a little bit of that, even despite the fact that the game was good. You know, it was just like, well, I have all this on useful stuff that I really don't care about. Yep. And you don't even recognize that you don't really right. care about it. By the time you, you recognize figure out you, that, hey, right. I'm at the end of the game. I really yeah. need to keep By the this. time you figure out that you don't need it, it's the game's almost over. Yeah. And it's of no consequence. But, uh, you know, hey, that those I guess those are the woes of RPG world. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty you much. Know, pretty some, much. some of them get it right and some of them don't. So, yes. Um, but I, I, I think uh, just like I said, from level play, I think Witcher got it. I think they're gonna get it right. I, you know, um, even if they don't, man, the place is just damn pretty to look at. Holy crap! <laughs> yes. It uh, is. Yeah, I just ride around on my pony. I, I like <laughs> that you uh, have uh, night and day going on there too, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, they those guys. Um, they're they're uh. Their uh, loot system looks, it look from what I've seen, looks pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, and your uh, customizations look pretty good. So very, very detailed. Yep. And, you know, so and, and it gives you a lot of options to switch things up, which I think is freaking awesome. You know, you're not going to get a Skyrim where you're like, all right, now I'm jacked. <laughs> now I can something. destroy everything with two everything. swipes. <laughs> pretty much. So. I don't think you're gonna get that in uh, Witcher. You're gonna you're gonna get a little, you know. You you may be able to do something, but you're not gonna be doing be able to do it with everybody. Right. Interesting. Yeah. It, we're we're gonna see where this this story. So far, the the story, it, I haven't really been able to place it too much, and I think that's mainly because I feel like I'm in the, coming in at the middle of the story. Yeah, it's so. It, like I said, some people like if if you haven't played the other ones, you're not gonna understand what the Wild Hunt is. But I think what they're gonna do in this one for for newcomers, um, they're they're actually gonna explain that a little later. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, and that's what I kind of figured. So I was like, yeah, you know, you're I, you're you're gonna get to that. So you're not I gonna can't be lost. burn it in that right. respect. Yep. But um, but yeah, yeah, that's that's a part of uh, you know, that's a part of any sequel. Anytime you come in that late in the game that's kind of one of the things that's it's interesting to see how they try to remedy that because you know when it comes you know it's a little bit different when it ends up being for like movies or books or something like that because they expect you to have seen all the other stuff or done all the other stuff you know before you come in and watch or read this particular book uh hey riley 83 what's going on thanks for joining us uh, we, we were talking a bit, a little bit about Witcher Three here, um, but uh, the the interesting thing I think with with video games is, and I've kind of seen this with a lot of the different sequels, is a lot of times even as they're telling, continuing the story for some, not all, but for some of like the big games, they have they usually try to have some kind of way that they sum everything else up in the previous games so that at least when you are going through the current storyline that you at least have some kind of ground zero that you can understand the game even if you started at halo 3 you know what i mean that you can still understand what's going on without having to say oh gosh i have to go back three halo games to figure out what's going on right now, I'm so lost. 
you know, thankfully Halo is simple enough of a storyline that you really don't care what happened. You're just like, yo, I just want to blast every alien in yeah, sight. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just point but, in my direction while I'll do the rest. <laughs> right, exactly. But um, other games like maybe, say, um, an Assassin's Creed game. Those are tough to follow if you don't Gears, play them. Yeah, or like Gears of War or... Um, you know some of those other games they have storylines where they in a sense you kind of need a at least a little bit from the previous games in order for you to fully grasp what's going on and they manage to to bring you to that ground zero of the storyline in order to keep everything up to date and say all right you know what we're gonna bring in all new gamers to this franchise in this game and they don't necessarily have to have played all the other games to understand the storyline in this particular one. Right. And I'm interested to see how and if Project Red does that in this game. I, I think they will. I think they will. I think uh, they can't be successful if the, if they don't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, because uh, people are going to get freaking confused. They're not going to know what the hell's going on. And and like, it, oh, this game is fresh, but I hate to do it. <laughs> right. Well, you know what? There's a, there, you know what? A lot of people do that with a lot of <laughs> games. You know, they just can't. Yeah. They don't know what the hell's going on. You know, and then they're like, oh, you know, they like, just trash it. Like, you know what? Bump this game. <laughs> right. You know, going back to play Halo. <laughs> pretty much. You know. Awesome! 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 So yes, we will definitely end up having more about which three as we both you know, parade through the rest of the game. Um, I'm certain Thicken Nation will have some streaming sessions as as will myself. Um, yes, sir. I already had like I had one big fat one last night, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did not too. the one you're thinking about. Ew. Oh, uh, <laughs> not that. Yes, sir. Oh man. But um one of the things I did kinda wanna wanna chat about a little bit that I love to get your insight on thinking nation was um back in the day when you had your trusty little commodore 64 or your apple 2e or whatever back in the day um you know in school this was something normal you know that everybody around that time frame in like the 80s and 90s had most more so in the 80s i guess you would say um we were all very familiar with like two or three educational games that were on virtually every computer in the nation. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, Oregon Trail and oh, Weird yeah, Worlds made, Carmen San, San Diego. Oh my goodness, they made me play Oregon Trail every time I went to lab, yo. Right, right, exactly. So that was like, it was almost like with every Apple IIe sale, they that they sent to a school, they basically gave them a copy of Oregon Trail and Where in the World's Carmen San Diego because everybody knew that, right? I actually like Carmen San Diego. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was an awesome little game, right? And I was reading through Gama Sutra uh, earlier and they had this article that said, that basically was like, where in the world did blockbuster educational games go? Because back in that time frame, um, even after, you know, Oregon Trail and everything, like in the late 80s and like early 90s, there was like this huge educational game boom. There was like a company called uh, Broderland. Um, there was another one called, uh, I want to say, The Learning Company or something like that. And there was like one more. And all three of these companies, you know, they made stuff like uh, Reader Rabbit, Math Blaster, um, some of the more classic old school, I don't want to say old school, but some of the more classic, actually highly rated um, educational games that um, just about every school had back in the day, right? Right. And all of a sudden, um, there was a time... There was a time there where um, all of those companies ended up not necessarily folding, but they got bought out by other software companies, right? Yeah. And what ended up happening was you started, and I actually was working at a Best Buy, and I kind of saw this trend go in this direction because there used to be like a bunch of these uh, educational um, 
modules where they would and I forget what the company's name was but I can like visualize the box because I would see the boxes all the time I'd have to stock them on the shelves all the time but they would have you know one software package for every grade level right and it was like this big blue and yellow box and you know be pre-k first grade second grade I can't remember the name of the company and then all of a sudden those boxes started getting smaller because it was around the same time frame that they released Windows 95, right? Right. And all the, all the software boxes started getting smaller, right? And this was like around the time that the, I guess you could say the boom of software on CDs was happening because they were phasing out all the three and a half disks and you were starting to see that they weren't putting all the software on three and a half uh, uh, disc, discs anymore. They were only putting them on CD-ROMs, right? Right. And then all of a sudden, a little company called SoftKey and uh, a few others started popping up. And you know how you used to be able to go into Staples and you could go in like the dollar bin and you could find any and every like type of software, you know, in like one little CD case. You could find like uh, in Carta, you could find like, um, you know, all these different typing simulators, all these different gaming packages or whatever, and they were all in like this one big bin. You know, they were just these CD cases, cellophane wrapped CD cases by SoftKey, and they had everything, right? It could be like a light CAD program, it could be anything, and but they were cheap, right? And, um, so what they were saying was that company ended up buying out a lot of those educational uh, software companies. And because of the price point, they ended up pricing out um, all of their profit margin. So these all these educational software companies, they would have like they would be very well staffed. They would have actual teachers as a part of their, you know, as a part of their uh development process as a part of the company not necessarily working with the company but they actually hired teachers in the company as they were working on the games developing the games each year and it would take them a long time to develop each revision of the game right and right. um you know they would market them directly to the schools they had a direct tie to like a lot of the school system so anytime they came out with one all the you know a lot of the schools usually saw them around those time frames right and then all of a sudden when like companies like SoftKey and everything popped up because of that price point um, and because they were saying okay we're looking more so for volume because we don't have the profit margins anymore we can't afford the staff that you guys had been using so they pared down all that stuff they started losing all their teachers they started losing some of the some of the things, some of the chemistry that they had that made those educational games as popular as they were, as well played and well known as they were back in the day. And all of a sudden those companies just disappeared completely and they stopped making all of those franchises, right? And, um, you know, so in this article, the guy was like, oh man, where did all these like major educational games go? He was like, uh, you know, Carmen San Diego doesn't exist anymore, and and uh, you know Oregon Trail. You know they tried to do one back in the day, but they got it wrong, and it wasn't good. You know there was like very little educational content in it, that kind of thing, and it was more game than edu. You know, it was more entertainment than edutainment, right? Right. And um, it was interesting because I kind of scrolled down. And uh, started looking at some of the comments, and basically what they ended up saying, which was basically true, is that you the edutainment field has really it hasn't disappeared. It's just evolved because nowadays, I mean, I think a lot of companies are recognizing this now. Nowadays, most development companies aren't making major software packages they're making apps yep and for the most part when you're selling an app you can't sell an app for like 40 and 50 bucks so you're not no. going to have an educational game on the market that you're going to sell 
at like forty to sixty dollars a pop. You know, you're gonna sell a little educational um, app or maybe even a service online or something like that, and either that game is gonna be free or it's gonna be like two bucks or something like that because you know the parents are gonna look at it and if they think it's cute. You know, and they have a demo for it. They aren't going to spend a whopping twenty to forty dollars on this one little game for their kids. You know that they are questionable as to whether or not there's any educational content in it at all. You know, uh, some some people are weird. I I think they would spend that money. <laughs> no, what what's interesting is um, for a software package that you install on your computer. No, I don't think parents would do that. But what they are doing now is like I guess you could say is the dawn of the the ABC mouse kind of a kind of a model, right? Um, I was looking through a number a number of like just comments and articles that were talking about like the rise of these different little educational services and a lot of them, kind of evolved because there's a lot more homeschooling going on so a lot of parents were looking for alternatives to going you know to a teaching store and buying you know let me just buy these books or whatever and i'll do the homeschooling i want something else that you know has some more uh engaging tools than just providing books and that kind of and that kind of sort of thing so um, outside of just having an ABC mouse or something like that, other parents were talking about um, these apps called uh, TimeForLearning.com and Starfall, um, where you actually take your kid, and it's kind of a similar pay scale as ABC mouse, but you essentially take your kid, you register that one kid um, for like a price per month with their service, and they have all these tons of modules and learning resources and all these other kind of things that um, you use as if um, as if you were going to engage upon a whole home learning kind of atmosphere for your kid. And I thought what was interesting is like some of the comments that I was seeing. You know, the most popular, of course, is like ABC Mouse. Right. But. Um, You know, some people are like, oh, this is fantastic. My kid loves it. He does it all the time. You know, everything he does for the most part gets him these little these little hats and gear and stuff for his little avatar, which reminds me of, you know, the Wii, you know, where you make your little me character and you put all kinds of faces and clothes and stuff on your me. And that ends up being your like identity when you use your your little Nintendo. Right. So I mean, ABC Mouse the, the apparently does a similar Xbox kind of thing. Trying to do? Yeah, apparently they do a similar kind of thing that as, as a reward for doing well in certain parts of you know ABC Mouse, they give you tokens where you can buy different things for your avatar and you make your avatar cool, have cool animations, and apparently that's supposed to be the carrot that they dangle in front of your kid. So if your kid buys into that then they love it and they're willing to continue to jump into it and to do whatever they ask them to do just so that they can get you know the next little hat or the little avatar gear right right so i was looking at some of the comments and some of the parents were like well you know it's just for like the age range that they're really catering to this thing just overstimulates the kid, you know. It's like they've got stuff moving over here. Every time you click something, fifteen different things pop up and make sounds and stuff. And they were like, "There's just too much stimulation, and it's kind of <laughs> questionable as to whether or not the kid is actually, you know, is learning really anything? learning at certain ages, right?" So, you know, they were like, "It seems as if it's decent as like a little supplemental kind of every now and then." Um, uh, kind of service, but when you want to, when you want your kid to get on something that you're actually paying for as a monthly subscription, you want something more than, you know, you want something a little bit deeper than them just getting on it for like maybe an hour a day as a supplement and them just saying, eh, okay, you know, hour I'm done, or not even an hour, you know what I mean? 
Right. You want it to be meaningful or or whatever, right? So they were suggesting some of these other services like Starfall and Time for Learning, and they were like a lot more of their instruction is real instruction, you know, because these systems are actually set up more so like uh, home learning, where they're actually going through an entire module and doing a whole lesson plan, you know, rather than just, hey, this is a game, you know, where I'm teaching you how to count from one to ten. Yay! You know, hey. the little character that bounces around every time you press Thank the right number. Do, 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 right? You know, it, it's like apparently from, you know, what I was gathering from reading, these other services were a lot more involved in terms of actually challenging, you know, the child a little bit more so in terms of giving them more towards what they are exhibiting that they know or don't know. You know, so it, it actually evaluates them a little bit, uh, a little bit more so than just saying, hey, you know, do this multiple choice questionnaire thing and just keep doing it until you get the right score. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's interesting to see that kind of thing and, um, you know, and, and to see like the rise of like Leapfrog and and all those other little you know, all those other little kid-based uh, tablets and hardware and app companies and stuff as they try to find some way to compete with, you know, the iPads <laughs> and everything that have basically infiltrated everything. Because, you know, when it all boils down to it, yeah, that leapfrog is cute or that, you know, I forget what all the other little kitty tablets and stuff are. But when you boil it down to what you actually have to use or pay for, you can fit a hundred leapfrogs in an iPad. Well, it's not even that. I mean, if you think about it, most of the time when people say, "Look, I'm going to get my kid a leapfrog uh, pad or something like that," because I can't afford to get my child, a, you know, an iPad just for them to use, right? Yeah. So. You start looking at the whole pay scale. Okay, you get that leapfrog for maybe a hundred bucks, but as you start looking into, okay, I want to get one app or one more cartridge or whatever for my kid to yeah, use. Yeah, what are those like thirty bucks a pop? Dude, they are so expensive. Yeah, they're like between twenty and thirty bucks each. You know, and then you know if you start looking at, uh, I remember I had the uh, the little leapfrog pin. Right. That apparently, you know, you get the books and then you can use the pen and then the pen actually can help the kid read. And, of course, it wasn't helping my kid read. He was just, you know, pressing it here and there. And he <laughs> basically wasn't reading at all. He was just, yeah, I'm going to let it do it. I was like, no, you're supposed to try to read it. And then the ones you can't read, you press the button. And then I thought about it. I was like, dude, that whole that whole process really defeats well, actually, I take that back. I got to give my wife some credit here. She was basically the one that was laughing at me. She was like, that really steals the whole purpose of you reading with your child in the first place. You know, if you get a book well, and they can't read yeah. it and they're trying to read it, you know, you're in a sense, you're, even if you aren't reading it with them, just having them interact with you and say, yo, dad or mom, I can't read this one word. Hey, sound it out. And they try to sound it out. They can't sound it out. You got to come over. You help them out with it. You know what I mean? Right. And, you know, on the flip side, this little leapfrog pen or whatever, and they're pressing the little thing and just reading it. And, you know, my kids were laughing because they weren't even reading it anyway. They were just pressing on the pictures to see what the pen would say. And ultimately, you know what I mean? And ultimately, they didn't care about the book or care about reading the book at all. They just wanted to see what cool sounds or what cool sound effects or stuff would happen if they pressed on various parts of the pages. And it became a game to them rather than a book, which, as you can imagine, defeats the whole purpose of the book in the first place. That's right. So, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to see how, you know, stuff like that that LeapFrog makes – and develops that, you know, you're like, oh, geez, I want my kid to have more than just two little leapfrog cartridges for his, you know, for I his I think they were hot pad. for at one point in time, but you're right. I think other other mobile devices have kind of killed. Yes. Yeah, at one point, all that leapfrog stuff 
you know, it was a cool alternative because iPads really hadn't like dominated the uh, technology. Or even scene. even or even when they weren't around. But like the yeah. thing is with Leapfrog, like a lot of their screens is so nineteen ninety, you know, and you know Well yeah, people, and they kinda have to in order to keep their cost down. Which kinda right. hurts them. Which kind, of, which kind of hurts them, but what I, I, I mean, you know, they don't really need to keep the cost down that much, you know. I think parents would rather spend, you know, two hundred bucks on something that they can, uh, you know, enjoy and and have, you know, maybe better graphics and stuff like that. And you know, some people are like, oh, well, that's not that important. Yeah, you know what it is. Yeah, because so, the kids see what you're using on your iPad, and they, they're like, yo, look, I want that. Right. <laughs> And ultimately, so that, that's, that's what ends that, up happening. That's what, I, what I, exactly you got. That's what ends up happening. So now, when I pay a hundred bucks for this device, and or, or, which most people already got their iPad, you know, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, and then you know they could download your whole Leapfrog library for two bucks. Yep. You know, you know, and 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 that's what they are. So they could either come out with it a better device or just support an app. You know, I think at this point, just go for the app, man. You probably make more dollars there. You know, and then instead of having, uh, you know, you sell it in the whole device, you just got an app and that's it. You well, know? and I think it's interesting. I think right now, at this point, they have so much competition because Android tablets are so cheap. Right. That and now play- you can get an off market tablet for like a hundred bucks that has you know in the android market and be able to get access to 10 times you know i don't know however many times more app educational apps or games or whatever on that tablet right. than the leapfrog where you yeah. have to spend Pay lord bucks knows bucks. how much right you know, and like most six stuff bucks I, I mean i think even their digital oh, stuff is like free. six bucks or something like that you know what i mean well a lot it's of stuff for free well yeah and a lot of stuff for free too because I have my kids doing uh, reading stuff, um, mm-hmm. just to try to keep them, you know, those those uh, those little brains going. Right. Reading and it's I don't pay anything. There's, these are free apps that I get, you know, mm-hmm. and I stick it on their iPad or their phone or whatever, and they're good to go. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah I, I just think Lee Prague is probably going to be dead and. A little bit. No, they're not going to make it. They're too close, man. Yeah, they. Uh, they it's interesting the kind of market that they have. You know what I mean? It. They have. You know, they have their. Uh, the familiarity of their logo and the fact that they're so prominent in places like Toys R Us. You know. So you go right. in there for a whole bunch of toys, and then you see the big, huge leapfrog thing. You're like, oh, you know what? My kid needs something even halfway educational, and then, you know, they get sucked in. They end up buying new little leapfrog, new little leap. I don't know. I, they I, still I, I get think, a decent amount of sales. They really I think do. they do, but I, I think parents are getting smarter. And yeah. I, I, I don't think give that them, uh, you give parents too much credit. Parents ain't smart. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm getting. <laughs> they buy whatever looks pretty at the moment. Oh, leapfrog's on sale! Ching. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 I think they're they're doing a lot better um, these days. You know, they're they're getting the right uh, tools for their kids. Oh, stop giving yourself so much credit. Thinking. We not I'm talking pro- about you. I'm talking <laughs> first. I don't have leapfrog in my crib. <laughs> uh, but you know what? You know what? A in- more interesting trend is. Um, and I mean, this has really come about a little bit more so thanks to, I guess you'd say, the indie market. Um, is there's like, I guess you could say, a bridge between an, an educational game and just a flat out entertainment game. Nowadays, we're starting to see more games um, kind of like this War Mine, um, Plague Incorporated, that are basically games that are focused around bringing awareness around certain issues whether they're social issues or political issues or um just things in general um that you know they aren't necessarily educational but it brings you into 
start thinking about um, new concepts or new things in a different way. You know, like, well, like, like I was <laughs> talking about before, uh, Plague Incorporated. Have you ever played that game before? No. So you know, it, it's pretty simple. Um, it is basically basically what it is is you take uh, you are a virus, and you basically are in try are trying to infect and destroy the entire human population on Earth. Yeah, boy. Right. So what you do and what it forces you to do as you are doing this diabolical scheme of yours. Uh, you are evolving your strain of your virus constantly so that you can evade all the different efforts that the world ends up having to make in order to prevent you from spreading and killing off the population. So essentially it puts you it, it puts you in the mind frame of what um, scientists actually have to do when something as scary as like the Ebola outbreak actually happens you know you it, it shows you what all the different countries end up, end up doing and what could happen you know if an outbreak got so uncontrollable and you know the strain kept evolving so I don't want to say so quickly but you know you've seen movies of that sort where hey you know there was an outbreak of said virus and they try to contain it, and then that one stupid person basically sneezes in a cup of lemonade, and then somebody else, you know, drinks that <laughs> lemonade, and then gets in a truck and drives <laughs> out of. You know what I'm saying? It, there's yeah. there's ways, you know, there are the different fears, and for some people that that kind of awareness just just is the, almost like fear mongering for some people, but it it still brings awareness to let you know, okay, this is what. Um, scientists are talking about when they say, you know, this particular strain, um, you know, it starts off in in uh, birds or it starts off in uh, pigs or whatever. So, you know, I even I even heard about this on NPR recently. They were like, they're trying really hard now to stop labeling all these different uh, viruses and strains after livestock because it's not accurate. You know, it's not necessarily where that virus or whatever began, and it's not like you have to go through and start killing off all the pigs, you know, because of the pig flu or all the chickens because of the bird flu or whatever. It's It just seems like that strain ends up um, being more susceptible to beginning in that community, you know, in that area or whatever. It can very well begin in humans, but it just seems like it's easier for that strain to start in chickens or mosquitoes or whatever, right? And, right. They, and, and that's how they end up naming it. So games like Plague, you know, they, you know, they they kind of seem like they have a weird nefarious plot, but underlying in that game itself, it's bringing you awareness of certain things and certain issues. And you you remember when we were talking about uh, this war of mine, right? Yep. And how that particular game is just so depressing and yet it's captivating enough and has a storyline that actually pulls you along and, and actually it, it's one of those kind of games that it it kind of for not necessarily forces you to have empathy but it's almost like it it's like an empathy builder because you know you actually have to care for the people that you're using in the game and you're trying to make sure their emotional state stays high or higher, you know, so that they don't get sad and leave you or commit suicide and all other kind of stuff. And all, all these different things are happening to all the survivors that you're trying to help. And, you know, you're recognizing, like, how desperate, you know, their situation is, what they have to look for, what they have to do, what they could encounter on something as di as simplistic as trying to get water for them to survive and all all in all they're doing this because there's this political war going on outside that's basically bombed out their local grocery store or the local you know uh, or the local uh, school 
And, you know, in those kind of situations, it's like because the governments are so involved in their war, it's like everything around you break society almost breaks down at that point and it ends up becoming survival of the fittest and you're sitting there looking at yourself and like okay what time frame am i are they living <laughs> in right now you know all these different kind of atrocities are happening simply because there's a war going on around them and there's no government it's just total chaos you know and that kind of thing is actually happening you know elsewhere in the world and it's stuff like that that kind of for some people, you know, some people just look at it and be like, oh, this is just game, da, da, da. But, you know, the developer themselves, there's a choice amount of people that are going to look at the game and actually appreciate the game for what they intended it for, which was kind of an awareness kind of thing, you know. And uh, for some people, it hits them in that way, you know, when they encounter, so you know, games such as that. Um, another one that I saw uh, that's kind of like that. Uh, that I don't want to necessarily say is right up your alley, but um, you remember we were talking where uh, what is it called? Uh, Watch Dogs, right? Yep. In a weird way, Watch Dogs is kind of that is in kind of that vein, right? Because the big brother whole thing, and... right? It, it kind of speaks to the whole uh, cyber privacy, you know, the whole privacy uh, debate when it comes to technology and all the data mining that all these different companies are doing your digital imprint is there <laughs> you Dude, know I'm because telling you everybody we we should be scared man we're gonna be yeah. in the matrix pretty soon exactly hey, i mean we'll be in the matrix or terminator five i mean you know in just about every movie or storyline that has to do with like current times or future times even hints at it because i mean if you think about it this last what was it this last uh captain america winter soldier Yep. Right. What was the big overarching theme that Hydra was basically using? You remember? Uh, what the computer system that they had? Right. Their computer system was tied in essentially to every amount of data mining for every person. So they were able to determine who they were going to take out that was going to become a possible threat in the future based off all based off of all the data they already had on that person right so they were already identifying current targets and future targets based off of that person's digital imprint at that moment so they were basically predicting they're like look this person has a high tendency to become a terrorist in the future because of their current outlook on life religion you know their financial status and all this other kind of stuff you're high risk I'm shooting Thicken Nation in the head because Jeff he is a future revolutionary. And that was the whole, you know, and that was a big portion of their whole, right. uh, you know, their whole thing. You know, Hydra was like, we're going to make society safer by basically paring down the entire po uh, human population to a more manageable, uh, you know, more dumbed down society. All the free thinkers. We're basically taking out all the free thinkers and all the people that are loyal, that are followers. Those are the people that we're going to leave alive. Yep. And it's, it's that's kinda basically like, what they were doing. It's uh, Divergent. <laughs> oh, well, that's another one, right? Yep. Divergent. Yep. So that's pretty much the concept of Divergent right there. Yeah. We don't want you to think. We want you to follow. Yes, we want you to follow. We don't want you to be a free thinker. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's I think there are a lot, of, you know, in this whole age of independent developers looking for some way to make their mark on the industry. You know, they're all finding that there are very few storylines that they can delve into that yeah. haven't really been delved into before. So they're looking for ways to be unique. So instead of saying, oh, I'm making another story about this badass weapons expert that knows every martial arts known to man that can kill robots and aliens in a single bound, you know, um, they're actually going and doing set pieces in different uh, time frames, right. you know, um, 
companies like Telltale Games, they're actually, you know, you know, I mean, I know they're really taking, they're really taking on existing franchises, but you know, they're doing it story based. They're actually, they're they're looking for ways to take that whole awareness style to, um, you know, to kind of make their mark and say that, oh, okay, this video game franchise is unique because even though we're using something that's very familiar in terms of like maybe a game engine or something like that the story has to do with something that might end up being kind of personal to you you know because it it's it uh, kind of opens the door to something socially that you may have encountered in your life or something like that no so it, it, it's interesting to see a lot of these uh, Kickstarter program indie games that pop up all over the place because a lot more of that kind of stuff is starting to be seen. Actually, I think there's one, um, and I'm not certain exactly what the social commentary is for this game yet because I think you kind of have to play for it, play through it. Um, this one new game called Sunset. Uh, I recently got a review copy of but um, you know there's still it hasn't released yet. it's not going to release for another couple of days so I can't uh, really delve too far into it but um, I'm going to start streaming it it's prob- maybe this weekend if not next week and uh, it, it's like a 100% story based game and it's a first person perspective but it's a narrative game you aren't shooting anything you aren't destroying anything and from my understanding what it is is this one you basically are a, a, a housekeeper <laughs> and you're going into like this high-rise apartment to clean this like millionaires apartment like every day right and apparently you're supposed to interact with him from time to time but at the same time, I think outside of your building, um, it's like the whatever country that you're in, it's breaking down and it's getting ready to go to war or something like that. So it's like right at the cusp of a conflict that's happening. And I think I think the person that you're like cleaning the house for, you can influence them a bit and they are involved in the politics of said war or something like that something to that effect i think um so you know it's interesting to see stuff like that come out to see how number one to see how interesting it is but to see how uh what kind of concept they're really trying to drive what kind of social commentary or awareness they're trying to bring to light using using this platform because a lot more people are looking into it especially with the dawn of virtual reality. You know there's going to be more oh, quote-unquote awareness style games with that technology coming out. You know? Pretty much. I mean, I, I saw some stuff on uh, Oculus uh, that uh, they, they had out there. Uh, I, I don't know. It seems like it's getting questionable at this point whether that's going to really kick off. Oh, it's been questionable from the jump. Their biggest issue is... Uh, computing power and what they're recognizing is their headset and all their sensors and stuff are going to cost a pretty penny from the jump and that's not including the amount of processing power that your rig is going to have to deliver in order to give that headset the resolution and frame rate that it needs to be believable you know what I mean right so what I think was interesting was Microsoft recently, um, they recently said that they have their own virtual reality project coming in, and guess what they're actually basing their technology on? Rifty. Say what? Rifty. Nope. Nope. They are basing their technology on the same kind of platform, or not platform, or approach that they had with the Xbox One. Really? Where they're essentially going to ease the processing power on your hardware by utilizing the cloud. 
we'll so see that, how that works. Right, and it's... I'm not 100% sold on that yet. <laughs> well, of course, they aren't sold on it because it's still a research project. But um, but that's that's what they identified as a problem with the current generation of virtual reality headsets is the amount of processing power it takes to achieve the frame rate that's needed for something that's a believable experience. And, um, you know, right now, like you said, I think the, what is it, the Vive or the Vive, or I don't know how you pronounce it. It's supposed to come out this fall. It's supposed to be the first one that hits the market commercially of this particular generation. There's other headsets that are out now, but the big name ones, the Vive, the Oculus Rift, the Project Morpheus, and the, uh, what's the other one? Is that what the Halo Lens? So, no, Halo. that's augmented reality. That's not VR. Um, there's one more that I can't remember. Um, HTC's V, the Oculus Rift, Project Morpheus, and the Rubber Dubs. I'll just call it Rubber Dubs for now. Whatever it's called. <laughs> the Rubber Dubs. They, uh, you know, all the rest of those headsets are quote unquote planned to be re- released at the first quarter of 2016 right right but even with the close proximity of the fall 2015 none of them have revealed how much these headsets are going to be they're, they're going to be an arm and leg i can tell you that right now if they're going to if they're going to dump out what they're talking about well that's the I'm thing i'm i'm, I'm thinking don't... about it they they I'm have thinking. no idea how how um, receptive consumers are going to be to virtual reality in terms of their need to buy the technology because right now it's considered a frivolous piece of tech right you know it, it's not necessarily you know there's no killer app for virtual reality that is going to sell stuff. Apple's not making a virtual reality headset. And that's basically the way I'll put it. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, not not yet. Right, because Apple even recognizes that there's nothing really that would push them to want to delve into that, right? Because, I mean, when you think about it, to have virtual reality, you have to visually and your visual your visual sense and your audio sense are completely dominated by this headset yep so everything that's around you you can't enter well it's not that you can't interact with it it's impaired because you have this headset on right yep. so it's like there aren't that many people that are going and we've kind of talked about this before there aren't going to be that many people who are going to be willing to clear out that kind of space in their house in a room so that they can fully immerse themselves in Oculus Rift size you know and actually be able to walk around without bumping into their wall their chair, their kid their dog (laughs) you know and hurt themselves or not be able to reach whatever it is they're reaching for in virtual reality Right. You know? So it, it, it kind of begs the question. It's like, okay, with that in mind, um, you know, what, where is the right price point for this? They can't put it too low because they'll never be able Make to recoup. Money. You know? Yeah. It, it'll take too many units for them to recoup. Their profit margin will be so low. And they can't put it too I think high it's, I think because it's it'll be, price uh, people out of the market, and then they just won't get any volume at all. So I think, I think the uh, only price point or the price range that we've heard so far, I think with the Vive, no, it wasn't with Vive. Oculus Rift said their price is going to be somewhere between two hundred dollars and a thousand dollars. You realize no. how big of a range that is? That's a huge range. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Two hundred and a thousand dollars. That's 
pretty significant. That's uh, that's that, that's more insignificant. <laughs> that, you know what I mean? It 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 kind of make it kind of makes. You know, if I was a developer for virtual reality, it would kind of make me nervous as to whether it's worth my time right now to spend a lot of resources doing something on it when it when the market itself is so uncertain, despite the amount of, you know, hardware vendors that are trying to push stuff out. You know, Steam is all for it. They've got a lot of people ready to release games and stuff for it but again you're still stuck in the same boat you know you're gonna have to have that killer steam machine you know they keep talking about hooked up to their oculus right. rift in order for you to really be able to uh delve rift. into this <laughs> for you to rip yeah and you're you know and then on top of that if you want to be able to chill and sit in your seat and do it you know, you're going to have to, there's probably only going to be a certain small amount of uh, games that you can do that sitting down in. Right. You know, you're going to have to buy one of those platforms that I was, you know, what was it? The the VR chair that we uh, interviewed a while back where they came on and we're talking about, hey, you know, rather than having a one of those massive platforms that you walk around in you know almost like a treadmill you can use this chair that you can actually sit in and it simulates everything you know there's i still think there's going to be a choice few people that even buy into that whether it's the hey, chair or the platform hey, or whatever to go along hey. with their headset to go along with their shiny new vr rig right. <laughs> you know you're looking at a good hey, three thousand bucks yeah easily <laughs> and you know what gamers aren't willing to pay that kind of money for yeah, or, it, it it seems. I mean, they're they're pushing it right now at sixty bucks, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, to me, it seems like a stretch, a pretty big stretch. I don't know, but you know what doesn't seem like a stretch? Virtual reality theme park. Uh, they, I think they already have those. They do, but they're getting bigger now. Yeah, I know Disney has a lot of stuff uh, with that in in uh, Disney World, where you put on headsets and you, they, yes. they simulate uh, roller coasters and other things. Yes, but imagine this, because I saw I saw a trailer for it in Utah. Apparently, they are developing an entire theme park that's going to be virtual reality, so that instead of you know having instead of having you sit in something and put the headset on and you experience it imagine if you wanted to uh, basically play a session of Starfleet Command where you me and like four or five other people wanted to be on Starship Enterprise all of us would have headsets on and they would have a specially made I guess you'd say uh, bridge that you could actually walk around in, sit down in, interact with and almost as if it was like using augmented reality but not really you're using the goggle, the VR goggles they would project or simulate all the different screens and buttons and guns or whatever on the existing uh I guess you could say set, movie set, that they would allow you to walk around in. Different themes, all different kinds of themes, whether it's fantasy, sci-fi, uh, who knows what. But Dude, apparently, I'd be canned after gray. Yeah, exactly. Um, apparently, a company has bought into that big time over in Utah. And uh, you know what? I'm going to try to see if I can find it real quick. Uh, Utah Virtual Reality Theme Park. I'm trying to see what that is. Let's see. Yes, here on CNET, there was an article on CNET saying that a virtual reality theme park will give visitors matrix like powers. Places called The Void. 
Um, da, 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 da. Yes, in a place known as The Void is set to debut in 2016 in Pleasant Grove, Utah, and is meant to be the first of many such centers around the world. It said the rooms are continuously con reconfigurable and can even have their surfaces change. Meaning that if your VR headset has you hiding behind a tree, you could feel its rough bark. If you're trying to open a spaceport, you could feel the metal beneath your hand. So uh, essentially, it's almost like adding, you know, another dimension to what's already existing. So this thing actually already has a website, which is smart. Um, it is thevoid.com, and of course they have. Uh, this the trailer that I was looking at where they basically are showing people walking around like a little movie set area and then it's projecting all of the uh, interaction and everything with the special effects and everything in the actual headset you know so it's got like they apparently they had a version of Doom that they were uh, you know demoing or whatever um, but it it looks like it's pretty uh pretty freaking intense, really. <laughs> yeah, it's really well, interesting. I th uh, yeah, I think a lot of that's gonna be intense. It's just whether you have uh, space for it. Well, that's what I'm saying. They're making a theme park for it, so they're buying the space for it. They're making an entire theme park. It wouldn't even have to be that big. Yeah, you know, it's like a warehouse kind of size, right. really. Pretty, pretty smart. I wish I had thought of it myself. <laughs> yeah, then you need capital money, the whole nine. You know, well, duty shoot, duty. there's... Hey, with freaking... What's his name? Putting billions of dollars into Oculus Rift. Dude, to get, on, to get in on that same kind of fervor that billionaires probably have right now to buy into the next big thing... You know, with all the, with everything that we've been talking about in terms of the uncertainty of VR, this seems like a perfect application for it. I really think people would pay to go to this place repetitively just to play or do whatever it is that they're going to have there. You know, and they can uh, charge uh, a decent amount for the experience too. Yeah, you know, you know, what I think what would really make some mega bucks is not even, um, you know, like having a, a a theme park, but but just having a regular, like a place like Dave and Buster's where you have enough space, and you can actually go around in there. I, I think you'd make more money there because it, it'll be local. You won't have to go to a ridiculously far place. Well, that's what they're trying to do, though. They're trying to make multiple places. This is just the first one that they're doing. That's what they're saying. They're not doing just one big place. They're doing a lot of different ones. So, you know, it, it, it looks like they're trying to do their whole, their whole, uh, hey, you know, this theme park is going to be like freaking Six Flags. We're going to have one within spinning distance of everybody eventually <laughs> right which is pretty cool uh, I think it's pretty interesting so you gonna have to get your ticket summer 2016 <laughs> me and Vicky right, are gonna get invited to the void and we gonna go out there we're gonna, have our GoPro, we're gonna have our GoPros on and we're gonna we're gonna stream the void of course this is all you know, fantasy. Yeah. That's probably yeah, right at this point. But we that's what we want. So Void, I'm gonna be calling y'all tomorrow. We gonna talk. <laughs> we gonna get Geek swag is gonna be fresh all up in the void. We're gonna do this. We want it. We need we it. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have it. it. <laughs> my precious. Uh, <laughs> my precious. Oh man. So, ladies and gentlemen. I think that was an awesome episode as usual. Um, we thank you guys so much for being a part of a part of the show, um, listening to the show, watching the show. Um, I'm trying to get back on the grind of getting uh, new guests and everything on the show. 
Um, it, as you very well know, life can be very, 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 very busy. And I felt like I've been slacking on that. I've been trying to get guests or telling you guys I'm going to get new guests and everything for quite some time. So I'm working on it. I'm going to make it happen. Um, in the meantime, uh, Dirty Helmato, tell the people what you're going to be doing, like time frames you're going to be streaming so that they'll have an idea of when they Thursday, can get their Thursday, Thursday night, Dirty Helmato fix. Yeah, Thursday night, uh, probably, I'm thinking about probably 9 to midnight, I'll be doing some serious streaming, of course, Witcher 3, so catch it here. Uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, look me up, it'll be Dirty Helmet, Witcher 3, boom, go find me, I'll be there. I'll be getting my clickety-clickety-clack on, so please come and join me and, and enjoy the session. No doubt. Interact. Talk to him. Make fun of him. Yes, Tell him how it. big his neck rolls are as he's playing. Please, I implore you, y'all. He loves it when I do it, so he'll love it even more when you do it. That's right. It's uh, thinking in Elasto Man. Or <laughs> <laughs> win adventure, baby. That's what we do. That's right. And on the flip side, myself, I, uh, I'm i definitely going to be playing some Witcher 3 this week. Um, I will probably play some on this channel uh, tomorrow night in my regular time slot at uh, 10 p.m. Um, but I'm going to try to flip the script and maybe on the 21st. When is that? That is Thursday. Yes, I sir. think on Thursday I am actually going to flip it a little bit and do a bit of the sunset gameplay maybe that evening. Just to see what that's like and give you guys a little taste of what that is um i gotta i gotta apologize to uh uh iceberg i kept mispronouncing the name of their game last week it's not vector drive it's vector thrust um i'm gonna try to get some additional gameplay of that as well and um i did want to give a shout out to v moda if you guys didn't notice already i have been this episode i've been using shiny new uh set of headphones here um apparently they are like the number one uh headset seller on amazon or something like that i don't know um but they are called the v moda headset and you know it's from my understanding well let me ask you jake can you like hear me any better do i sound any crisper or any different or whatever via their microphone if you didn't mention you had a new pair of headsets, I couldn't tell you. You couldn't tell? Okay, so no. uh, the microphone probably is about the same. I, from what I'm hearing from Th Thick Nation here, the you know microphone is probably about the same quality as what I was using before, which was a uh, uh, Turtle Beach, Turtle Beaches. Turtle Beaches. Um, but, um, you know, the sound quality, quality for this is pretty nice. Um, I, I can't remember exactly what the price range for these things are, but the true true test for this thing is going to be when I actually try to uh, listen to some movies or some gameplay with this thing um, to see really really how this how this thing sounds. Maybe try to use it a little bit when uh, when I do some uh, multiplayer gaming on on my Xbox One to see if people say, hey, I can barely hear you, or hey, you sound pretty fresh, or I don't know. You know how that goes. <laughs> you can always tell you know, what people are using, if they're using their Kinect, or if they're using a bad headset or a good headset uh, when they're uh, you know, talking to you or chatting with you or whatever. But, ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, that is a show. We thank you guys so much for, for being with us. Um, as usual, that person up there above me, he is dirty. somebody. <laughs> dirty. Yes, Dirty, dirty. Helmato. See right there, Dirty, dirty. Helmato. That is dirty. him. And dirty. I am your boy, Bunny3000. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks again to ladies of the round, round table. We doing it big, L-O-R-T Nation. Deuces, people. We are out. Love y'all.